Hello, good morning and welcome to Learn with Lorna 114. My name is Lorna Steele McGinn, I'm a Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. And the Highland Archive Service has four archive centres around the Highlands of Scotland, in Inverness, in Portree, in Fort William and in Wick. This series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. If you're able to donate towards our work, then we're very grateful to that. And I know that many of those who will be uh, watching today will already have done so. So thank you very much for that. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'm saying everyone, I'm very much, oh yes, I'm seeing words coming up now. I'm saying I very much hope people are back with me. Uh, thank you so much for rejoining after the break that we've had over the summer. It's really nice already to see everybody's names coming up uh, and see all, all my old friends from earlier in the year. Um, I hope you've had a good break over the summer. Uh, I am calling it a break, but it's been very, very hectic. So I have been uh, involved in all sorts of different things, some of which you may have seen on our social media pages. So I have worked with um, Ukrainian refugees. I've done a lot of school work, um, summer activities with young people in the Highlands, uh, working with Highland Games, uh, community events, been down uh, a lot in our Loch Aber Archive Centre in Cool. We had a big event to mark the uh, anniversary of the Keswick Bridge. Um, we've, I've been doing a lot of filming, so I've been doing some filming with BBC and Channel 4, so there'll be some things coming out um, that I can flag to you over the next wee while. And creating uh, online exhibitions, including our education exhibition. So it's been a very, very busy um, few months since I last spoke to you. But for now, back to Learn with Lorna and our uh, weekly get together, weekly chat. I should warn you straight away that the first few will be live and then I'm going to do a few pre-recorded because I'm going on leave. So although you probably feel like I've been on leave for the last few months, I haven't been. <laughs> so I will be going away. Um, and so I'll the, the next uh, there will be a few pre-recorded in uh, October and the end of September. But for our first one back um, in September, I thought that I would start with a favourite subject again, a favourite subject to a lot of people. Um, who engage with us online, but also a lot of people who come into our search rooms, school logbooks. School logbooks are some of our most beloved um, documents. And we have over 700 of them across all four of our archive centres. It also ties in with our new theme starting on social media today, September, which is um, in living memory. And also with our new online exhibition, which is marking 150 years since the Education Act in 1862. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that exhibition, please do, um, but I'll put a link up at the end of this talk for you to do so. Now, school logbooks, as you may remember if you watched the previous one on this, uh, were kept weekly in schools for over 100 years. And teachers would record information about attendance figures, about uh, the weather, school buildings, local events, and also the local impact of national and international events. And the majority of these date from 1872 onwards, as record keeping became more standardised following the Education Scotland Act. Some do date from pre the Education Act, but they tend to be from free church schools. Um, and school logbooks were phased out from the 1980s onwards. And it's a real loss and it will be a real loss going forward that those stories and that information uh, will be not being collected anymore. I mentioned I've already covered some stories from school logbooks in um, Learn with Lorna 46 back in February 2021, but there are always more stories to be shared from logbooks. So let's start by what logbooks can tell us about the day-to-day -day running of schools in the past, the maintenance, the cleaning and the equipment. Now, many of those things, much like today, many of those things of maintaining and running and cleaning and equipping a school happen quietly behind the scenes. And they only come into focus when there's a problem or a crisis of, or something that brings them to the, for, to the forefront. So for instance, cleaners, we know that schools have always been cleaned, have always been looked after. 
but generally it's only explicitly mentioned in these logbooks when something happens, like if an epidemic requires the school to be deep cleaned, or if the school struggles to find a cleaner, um, or maybe when a cleaner is accused of something, as in this extract from St Mary's Episcopal uh, School Logbook in Glencoe. This dates from April 1927. April the 7th. This morning, the teacher found that her desk had been tampered with, presumably by the cleaner, and that a number of slate pencils had disappeared, while the logbook was defaced as seen on this page. The seeds planted in the sawdust have been tampered with, also the tadpoles which have been hatched from spawn by the children. And it's something, um, there's something sort of Enid Blythony about that wording, but also just that um, things have been tampered with, presumably by the cleaner. Slate pencils have disappeared. The logbook has been defaced. It all makes it sound quite deliberate. And it's interesting that the teacher writes there, um, the logbook was defaced, as you can see. And when you look at the logbook, you can see there's a huge sort of splosh of ink that has been dropped over the page. So who knows whether it was deliberate or not, but it sounds like um, if it was, the, the cleaner might have had uh, a reason. So it's in those sort of passing comments of something unusual that you discover what is so routine that it's not usually recorded on a daily basis. It's just happening all the time in the background. Now, in a similar way, we can discover about the equipment that's used in schools. And it's when there's a moment of change that somebody will talk about it. So, for instance, this is another St Mary's. This is a Roman Catholic school in Fort William. And when it was opened in January 1872, the first entry says this. St Mary's School, Fort William, opened on this day under the, change of Car under the charge of Caroline McCarty, a certified teacher from the Liverpool Training College. At this date, the books and apparatus provided for carrying on schoolwork consist of an adequate number of copies of each of Burns' standard reading books, reading sheets, religious reading books, six dozen Phillips copy books, 40 slates and a box of 100 slate pencils, a blackboard and Phillips maps of the world, Europe, England, Scotland and Ireland. So two things to note there. Um, the fact that, as I say, it's only because there's a moment of change in the school has opened, something has happened that that person, the teacher, has then written in what the equipment is. So we know that all of the schools will have had equipment like this, but they're not bothering to record it most of the time. So we can find out what's there. But the second thing I found really noticeable, and if any of you spend any time in schools, I spend a lot of time in schools, um, you'll know schools now are full of colour and drawings and things pinned to the wall and leaf paintings and life-size drawings of the, their class and just so full of colour and excitement as well as of course smart boards and chromebooks and um, everything links to the screen and, and so on and when you see there that that new school is opened with reading books reading sheets religious books copy books slates pencils and four maps and that's it it's quite extraordinary there's a similar list that we can see in uh, Rose Markey's school logbook and that one is because the school is closing so school closed in 1937 and the keys were handed back and this is what was left in the building this is the final entry in the school logbook so we've moved on now 50 years so it lists the closing equipment one old-fashioned long desk two old-fashioned dual desks one bookcase in two sections one coal scuttle one pail two large jugs for cocoa, one hearth brush, one shovel, all wall maps specified in separate inventory. All the old registers and other school records and books have been put into one cupboard in the classroom. The keys of the school and the schoolhouse have been handed in at the education office. So again, you can see um, at the moment that they're closing the school, that they're recording what's been left in it. Sometimes there were issues getting equipment into schools and um, a school in Glencoe could do no drawing at one point in 1927 because they had no pencils to their name so they could do no drawing. There are references in Borrowdale and Glenetive schools 
about the lack of coal and peat, which meant that they couldn't heat the classrooms. And incidentally, it was in 1894 that Scottish Education Department said that pupils no longer needed to carry a piece of peat to school every day to add to the fire. In Loch Allen, in Morven, in 1914, there was some confusion caused and recorded in the logbook when the school's supply of material for cardboard modelling was sent to Malvern in Worcestershire rather than Morven in Loch Aber. And all of these uh, little details can be found. Sometimes the school logbooks give detail about problems with equipment or maintenance in buildings. For instance, in this extract from the Kilmaluig uh, school logbook in Sky. <clears throat> Kilmaluig Society School. The premises, furniture and apparatus are the same as last year and are all scandalously bad. For reasons of health, it is fortunate that the attendance is very poor. I was under the necessity of, of sending all the children outside and then taking a few of them in at a time for inspection. In the circumstances, good results are not to be looked for. There is some improvement in arithmetic, but otherwise results are very poor. A redeeming feature in the conduct of the school is the high character of the industrial work. On the whole, I'm delighted, uh, on the whole, I am disposed to think that sewing and knitting are more efficiently taught in this than in any other school that I have visited. My Lords have allowed the grant this year with a very great hesitation. They trust that no time will be lost in removing the school to, sent to suitable premises, as similar leniency may not again be shown. So that's quite a damning report. Everything, the premises, the furniture and the apparatus are scandalously bad and as scandalously bad as last year. And then to say that for reasons of health, it's fortunate that the attendance is very poor. So we almost don't want anyone else to come in because we can't look after them. Good to have a redeeming feature there that the um, industrial work and the sewing and the knitting are better than elsewhere. Um, but also that the grant for the school, it notes, has been given with great hesitation. But if they don't improve, it will be withdrawn uh, from next year. There are also incidents um, recorded in the school logbooks. So this was one and I'm sure it would not have been funny at the time, but it, it brought a smile to my face. OK, sometimes there are more immediate crises than others that occur. This is an extract from 1914 from Laid School. A pigeon flew through two panes of glass in opposite windows. I reported the matter to Mr Stewart uh, as Mr McKeever, the attendance manager, was, was from home. So he, they had to report it to somebody else. The school was so cold that we had to dismiss it. And then the next uh, couple of days, it says no meeting of the school sent pupils home until repairs are executed. Just quite extraordinary that a pigeon would fly not only smash through one window, but then carry on and smash out through the other side. Um, you know, I, I say I work a lot in schools. I speak to a lot of teachers and they always say, you know, the things that the kids remember, and I'm sure you'll be the same, but the things that the kids remember are things like the day a cat got into the playground and it caused so much excitement. Can you imagine if a pigeon flew through one window and then out through the other window? I can only imagine the, the excitement that caused in the school and then getting a day off for the windows to be repaired. Um, <clears throat> yes, we're just going into a war at that point, but also pigeons were causing drama. There are also all sorts of other kind of um, incidents and events recorded in school logbooks. So the Aldowry school logbook from 1925 records a six year old pupil being given a month's leave by medical certificate. But then 11 days later, the logbook records the child's death. The pupils subscribed to a wreath and a party of the boys were allowed to attend the funeral and the school closed early uh, as a mark of respect. And those things are one or two sentences in a logbook, but you can only imagine the impact of that on a small community in a small school community to have to cope with the death of a six year old child. There are also lesser illnesses and incidents and accidents recorded in school logbooks, such as broken bones and burns and um, accidents caused by the fire and things. There are also incidents recorded which are bad but could have been much worse. So, for instance, in 1931, 
in the Dewsdale School uh, logbook, it records the poisoning of the water. There's also a record of the spreading of measles that had been, it had happened because um, a returned Royal Naval Reserve um, person had come back to Borrowdale and had, on arriving back, had met with many of the children in the community, spoken to them, walked with them, and then as a result, suddenly the epidemic spreads and that's recorded um, in a school logbook. Or what about this one, which is an incident recorded in the Newlands School logbook uh, in Latheran Parish in Caithness. I, I say I work a lot with teachers. I was going to say some of you might be teachers, but I'm guessing not watching live. But um, I have always known how incredibly difficult a job it is. And I think you'll agree when you hear this extract from Newlands School in Caithness in 1877. 31st. Two or three boys that I spotted tonight going home will be tomorrow called up for assaulting another scholar. It is a point I will also consider whether the PTs, I think the pupil teachers, rendered any protection to said boy. And then the next day, lead proof in yesterday's case, found that this was a general conspiracy to slay Hugh Sutherland. I'm hoping that the word slay had a slightly lighter meaning in the past. Um, he yesterday showed himself an expert at picking out the talkers and put an unusually number and, and an unusually number and an unusually large number of them thereafter came to grief. So he had obviously sussed out who was chatting in the class, had told the teacher on them, and then they had been disciplined. The discontent of those who had been punished for talking took this diabolical shape, which would have ended seriously enough had I not singled out at the time a few of the ringleaders. So he's seen this bullying happening on the way home from school and he's worked out that it's because Hugh Sutherland had basically daubed in or clipped on some of the people talking in the class. <clears throat> I found that John Patterson caught Sutherland and struck him in the breast and that one of the PTs had prevented him from doing more harm at that time. Convicted another boy, S. McLeod, who instead of going home after the dismissal of the school, came off the road expressly to slay Sutherland gave Patterson and McLeod pretty severe thrashings. Patterson asked home, saying he felt unwell. I told him that if he really was unwell, he could go home, and he went. And half an hour afterwards, his father opened the door and came up to me with the boy with him. The father, when I went to speak to him, which was at my leisure, gave me impudence. I asked him in the civilest manner possible to be seated until I had heard the class. I then sat down with him to see if I could do anything for him. He seemed very much excited. He told me I was unfit to keep his son in order, etc, etc. I answered him by asking if he would have the goodness to go out the door. He therefore went off instantly, taking his son with him. <clears throat> so not only are you dealing with the, the talking in the class, then you're dealing with the bullying, and then you're dealing with the parents as well, who are coming in and interesting and perhaps typical of the era, that the father is not coming in and saying, you know, why have you punished my son? The father's saying, you're not capable of keeping my son in order, which I thought was interesting. Or what about this incident from Gersa in Caithness? December the 7th, 1877, so it's all happening in Caithness in 1877, Mr Andrew Lyle intimated a fear that the scholars were beginning to take turnips out of his field, which immediately adjoins the school. On inquiry, the scholars acknowledged that altogether nine Swedish turnips had been taken. The teacher pointed out the injurious effects, moral and pecuniary, consequent of such a detestable practice, insisted on its being at once desisted from, and to make amends for what had been done, that one pence for each turnip be paid as compensation. Investigating the matter took about an hour of school time and some classes could not be over to, could not be heard in the afternoon. So teachers are always dealing with all sorts of things. Now, in both of those extracts, the pupils were punished either by having to pay the money back in compensation or by being severely thrashed. So what do school logbooks tell us about punishment and discipline? There are passing references to pupils being disciplined, um, being hit by the, with the belt or the taws. I don't know if anyone 
remembers that. It only stopped in the 1980s. Um, for copying, for throwing stones and various other things. Some school logbooks have in them a copy of the instructions and rules for the use of corporate punishment. So for instance, in the Balmakara Farm School Logbook of 1958, there's the, a, an illustration of the rules, but also it really illustrates the gradual decline in the use of corporal punishment from the sort of 50s and 60s onwards, which is interesting because I'm sure that many people will have memories of it being used in the 70s and, and so on. And the fact that we know it was declining makes you wonder how much it was being used before. These rules include some really interesting and thought provoking points. So it says here, the Education Committee appreciate that the, so this is for Ross and Cromarty Council, but it will be very similar elsewhere. Um, the Education Committee appreciate that the incidence of corporal punishment in schools within the area of Ross and Cromarty has been substantially reduced and they trust that the reduction will be continued. So their aim is to, to phase it out. They recognise, however, that corporal punishment must be retained at present as an ultimate sanction for the maintenance of good order and discipline and make the following regulation, regulations to govern its use in Rothshire schools. One, where used, it will be used only as a last resort and will be directed to correction of the wrongdoer and to securing the conditions necessary for order in the school and for work in the classroom. Two, it shall be given by applying the strap to a pupil's hand and by no, mean, no other means whatsoever. Three, it shall be immediate, consistent and appropriate to the condition and blameworthiness of the pupil and it must never be excessive. Four, where a school has an infant department, corporal, corporal punishment shall not be used in that department unless very exceptional circumstances and then only after consultation with the head teacher and infant mistress, if any. Five, where a school has a secondary department, corporal punishment shall not be administered to a girl in that department unless in very exceptional circumstances, and then only after consultation with the head teacher and woman advisor, if any. Six, corporal punishment shall never be administered for failure in task due to a lack of ability or any kind of handicap on the part of a pupil. And seven, the strap shall not be in evidence when it is not being used to administer corporal punishment. <clears throat> so I thought those were really, really interesting because, and if any of you watching live or watching subsequently have memories of corporal punishment, please do get in touch with me or, or put them into the comments because on paper that sounds very measured um, you know, it should never be excessive use, it should always be proportionate, it should always be, it should never be administered due to lack of ability or any kind of handicap. Um, and also that it should only ever be a strap and applied to the hand and nothing else. Now, my parents who went to school in the 50s, 60s, have perfectly clear memories of being hit with rulers and all sorts of things and seeing things happen. So it's interesting that it would be interesting to see the difference between those rules and what was happening in the classroom. <clears throat> There's a lovely extract on page one of the Isle of Canna school logbook, which records the opening of a new school in 1878 and the introduction of discipline. So on November the 11th, 1878, Canna opened school this day with an attendance of 14 most of whom are on the alphabet. No school having been kept here for the last 15 years or thereby, the education of the youth of this place was passed by during that period. So they're saying, you know, we've had no school, so I'm starting with the alphabet, starting very um, simply. A couple of days later, received a few additional pupils, prospects not very encouraging, but resolved to make the best of the situation. And then a few days later again, work going on regularly, quite unaccustomed to school discipline, the children seem surprised at the restraints necess necessarily laid on them. And I love that, this image that there's been no school there for a while, and now the teacher is administering discipline and the children are going, what is, what, what's this? Um, there's a reference there to the children being started off on the alphabet. 
and the aim of the 1872 Education Scotland Act was to provide a basic education in reading, writing and arithmetic. But what else uh, did they learn? Well, there are references to all sorts of things. Nature study, household management, darning, gardening, singing, dancing. Um, some of that depends on the visiting teachers that were available in an area and some on the skills and the interests of the particular, of the usual class teacher. And some of it comes across in the inspector's reports. And I know I've spoken a lot um, about inspector's reports over the years, but there's one in Torin, which I particularly enjoyed, which records that the, the inspector had listened to the class singing and he says the singing was healthy, but disharmonious. So basically well done for showing up and trying. There are, I, I would be interested as well, I'm seeing your comments coming in. Um, yes, Fiona, I remember hearing other people talking about the, the chalkboard uh, uh, rubber being thrown at them as well. I would be interested to know what other subjects anyone remembers because um, I just recently rounded off a year long project with Central School in Inverness, um, which you may remember. And one of the things that came up in many, many of the oral histories we did with ex pupils and ex staff was having to do nature notes and having to go away at the weekend and find something in nature to write about. And everyone seems to have hated it. Like every pupil we've spoken to over decades, if you mention nature notes, it was, oh, hated nature notes. So let me know if you did nature notes and if you loved them. Um, there are also references sometimes in these school logbooks to much more in-depth uh, studies of a specific subject. So for instance, this is a four page extract from Gersa School in Caithness, and I won't read it all, but really interesting because I've never come across it in any other school logbook. And it starts in September the 7th, 1896. Something that I'm sure a lot of people think should be brought back, and I think it is starting to be brought back. The work connected with a dairy class was begun today. The method of using the various utensils was explained and the curdling of milk illustrated by its coagulation with ferment. And this goes on over a week or two. The composition of milk was studied the next day. Attention was directed to butter fat and the reason that it rises to the top of a dish of milk. Nature um, of emulsion was illustrated by a mixture of oil and water, which was left until the end of lessons, by which point the oil had been seen to rise above the water. The composition of milk was discovered in further, uh, was considered in further detail. So they're going on looking at what happens when you add rennet to it. And then a few days later, the proportion of rennet to milk for use in cheese making was illustrated by using a very small quantity of rennet to 10 pounds of milk. The proportion worked out by cheddar cheese makers was one of rennet to 9,000 of milk. A gallon of milk was proved to weigh whatever, so they're weighing the milk, they're working out how you add rennet to it, how you curdle the milk. And this goes on, as I said, for several days. Action of curd knife was exhibited and the desirability of cutting the curd into small cubes was explained. Attention was given to the points to be specifically attended to in the practice of making cheddar cheese. Over the next few days, they go on to look at how to store it, how to heat it, how to um, make it, and then they start going out to different places. So the class met at the Coval today. About 50 pounds of milk were secured and cheese making with large utensils was practiced. The whole class being present stayed until the curd was salted and vatted. And then later on, the class arranged to meet at Scotter, at Scotter Farm to get practice using other utensils. So I just found that really, really interesting because the, that level of detail into where food comes from, as I say, I think we went through a stage where that really didn't happen very much, but I think we're starting to do that sort of thing in schools again. You can also see in the school logbooks evidence of the school buildings being used. So there's people there going out of the school building to do something, but there's also evidence of the buildings being used by others. So we're familiar, certainly in the UK, I'm not sure about other countries, but certainly in the UK, we're familiar with our schools being used a lot for things other than education. So they're used as polling stations. 
uh, in elections. They've recently been used as vaccination hubs and um, vaccination centres. If there's a flood, if we go to war, then the school buildings become very, very central and important to that. But the World War II, uh, one of the World War II logbooks for aired school records that the Home Guard used the school for drill one day. And it wasn't doesn't seem to have been a routine thing. It seems to have been the fact that they had, they couldn't get into their usual place and so they wanted to use the school. And so all the pupils were shepherded into the teacher's sitting room and were taught there instead. St Mary's Episcopal School records that the school was used for a wedding and school was cancelled to facilitate a wedding happening in the building instead. I don't see Highland Council going for that um, very often. And I was struck by a 1934 school logbook entry for Glen Brittle School, which records that the school had been used as a youth hostel and had been left in such a state that the parents went on strike because they said it was unfit for their children to be in. And so the parents went on strike, the pupils didn't come in, and the teacher had to single-handedly scrub the building from top to bottom. But I wanted to close, um, we're at 11.30, but I wanted to close by sharing a story from Brabster School in Caithness. The story starts on the 8th of August 1941 with this entry. Frank Dunnett has been absent all week. He is afraid to come to school because of a bull grazing on open moorland. Intimi uh, intimation of this has been sent to the Director of Education. On the 15th of August, so nearly a week later, yep, yeah, a week later, New sessions work commenced in all classes. Frank Dunnett is still absent. The bull is still roaming at liberty, although intimations have been received from Mr McHardy on the 9th of August that the police have now been informed. 22nd of August. Frank Dunnett is still absent. Constable Gunn, May, called on Friday afternoon of last week. He had been to Mr Angus and the boy's parents. Mr Angus has refused to remove the bull from the open moor and Mr Dunnett has refused to send his child past the bull to school. So that's August. 14th of October. School reopened today after the autumn period of the vacation. All pupils present, except Frank Dunnett, who still refuses to come, the bull still being in the open field. See copy of letter from Chief Constable. And then we have a letter from the Chief Constable. We also have a letter from the Director of Education, which says, uh, Dear Miss Leach, I append here to a copy of a letter which I have received from the Chief Constable, from which it would seem that the situation will be cleared up after the short vacation. With reference to your call he uh, here the other day, I wrote to my Constable at May, who has again seen Mr Angus, and the latter says he cannot have the bull removed from the hill ground before the 19th of uh, of September when the schools close, but he will have the animal cleared off the ground before the schools reopen on the 7th of October. 15th of October. Frank Dunnett is back today. All pupils are present. The bull has been removed. So spare a thought when you're uh, thinking about this for poor Frank Dunnett missing 11 weeks of school because of the bull in the field on the way to school. I hope you've enjoyed hearing some of these stories. I hope you've enjoyed the return of, of Lerma Thorna and these stories from school logbooks. Please do have a look at our education exhibition online if you haven't done so. There's no charge for looking at it and it's obviously available right across the world because it's online. Um, if you're in and around any of our centres over the next couple of weeks, all four of us are taking part in National Doors Open Day. So uh, in Inverness, the 3rd of September, this Saturday coming, and we're doing behind the scenes tours and myself and various other colleagues will be there chatting about the service. Uh, if you are in and around Nucleus in Wick, then they'll be open on the 18th of September and I'll be up at that one with my colleagues. Lochaber and Sky are both on the 24th of September. Um, so if you're able to come along to any of those, it would be lovely to meet you in person. One other reminder, if you, you may recall me speaking at the beginning of the year about the fact that we have gaps in our collections and that we're trying to remedy that and uh, identify gaps and actively fill them. And I'm 
really excited that we're taking part in an LGBTQ project with Eden Court Theatre and we have gathering sessions happening at each of our archive centres for that. So if you're part of that community, please do get in touch with me. Um, I'd love to hear your story and add it into our collections. So I'll see you next week. Next week we'll be looking at historic NHS records and Highland Health Board records. And thank you again for coming back and uh, joining me again. I wasn't on my own, which was my fear. Um, so I'll see you next week. And a reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer. High Life Island is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then we're very grateful for that. And I'll maybe see you soon. But if not, I'll see you online next week. Thank you.